They were safe. It was all over but the fanfare. The goal had been set by President Kennedy nine years earlier. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. President Nixon paid a brief visit. He invited the astronauts to dinner at the White House. Now the astronauts belong to the world. men first landed on the moon, we watched the long sunset on the country they had come from. From the east coast, the tidewater country of Virginia, the small towns of the Midwest and South, the Great Plains, West of Hawaii, where it was almost tomorrow. The music you're hearing is part of the New World Symphony by Antonin Dvorak, a Czech who spent a pleasant July in Spillville, Iowa, 75 years earlier. The astronauts carried this tape all the way to the moon and back. In the cargo manifest of Apollo 11, it was listed as part of the personal support system. It's been 20 years now since that day, and we note this. Our days and our years are measured by the sun and its warmth. For most of us, the moon's a wanderer, slipping in and out of our nights, as elusive as memory. We live with it, but not by it. That's why we put these old scenes together, to drift back to a great day when the moon was at the center of our thoughts, and to remember three fine men who once went there and came back. All three men left the space program after the flight of Apollo 11. Once on the moon was enough. The training had been too rigorous, the crush of publicity too demanding. They wanted to get back to their private lives and private troubles. Over the years, CBS News taped their press conferences. The day of jubilation, 10 years later, 20 years later. You'll see time pass in their faces. Buzz Aldrin had the most trouble. 
10 years after the landing, talking about himself in the third person. Baldwin found that wearing and shedding the skin of heroism is no easy task. In seeking a new road, he fell into a state of depression and eventually underwent treatment at an Air Force hospital in Texas. Disguised in the, de in the depression was the creeping disease of alcoholism, which surfaced three and a half years later and was a struggle he describes as the most overriding event in his life. The space program was kindergarten in comparison to coping with the culminating effects of alcoholism. You get into a pattern of just gradually spiraling down. He overcame his marital and drinking problems and has since returned to public life as an author and space scientist. I, th I think it'd be a great under understatement to say that it was the most significant event that happened in my life. Uh, certainly, it, it changed my image of myself because of the image uh, that was changed throughout the world of me and then the ability to perhaps try to live up to that, to your standards and to my standards, was a most significant challenge. We're expected to be firm advocates for uh, the business that we were in for a good bit of our life, and, and I think we certainly are. We advocate expansion of uh, space activities as much as possible. Countdown is concerned, the prime crew now departing from their crew quarters here at the Kennedy Space Center. Astronauts Neil Armstrong, Armstrong, the most private and the most commanding of the three. He was offered millions for commercial endorsements. He was offered the opportunity to run for office. He refused it all. He became a professor and has now retired to a farm. I was delighted to be on the flight. Uh, it was worth uh, a great deal to me uh, personally. Uh, it's very privileged to... Uh, to uh, be a part of that, ir irrespective of the consequences. Two and a half, picking up some dust. The consequences, of course, were in City part exposure to the down. public eye, Thanks something down. Armstrong obviously dislikes. The high point of his forward. life were these right. last 30 seconds Thanks. over the moon. Two and a half, 30 seconds forward. The, the touchdown itself, from my point of view, was a real high in terms of elation. Not so much for the instant, but because it marked the achievement that a third of a million people had been working for a decade to accomplish. And it was a feeling of we, a third of a million people, managed it. The man who spoke most easily for Apollo 11 was Mike Collins, who circled the moon but never landed on it. He was a major general in the Air Force, an assistant secretary of state, and the director of the National Air and Space Museum. No, I, I, the only thing I would say is um, I, I, I think there is a, a little tinge of sadness to the fact that uh, at age 38, I had the, what will probably be the most fascinating job I'll ever have in my life. But, uh, you know, that's, that's tough. That's just the way it was and is, and that doesn't bother me. He was asked the inevitable question about space. Why fly to the moon while our social problems on Earth are such a mess? If we had pursued the, the logic that says uh, you have to take money from the space program and, and put it into restoring the cities, uh, uh, we, would, we would never have ventured beyond uh, uh, Jamestown or Plymouth. And we never would have gotten west beyond the Appalachian Mountains had we, uh, had we decided to uh, render those little colonies perfect before we continued our exploration. And I, I think that uh, Houston, you are the same thing is true today. We're a nation of explorers. I mean, we've started uh, on the East Coast, we went to the West Coast, and, and then vertically. I mean, uh, people have always gone where they've been able to go. It's in our tradition, it's in our culture, uh, it's a fundamental thing to want to go to touch to see to smell to learn and uh, that I think will continue in the future it takes nothing away from these three fine men to say their voyage to the moon was as much an end as it was a beginning except for the shuttle disaster America's interest in space has waned steadily since the first landing on the moon ten other men walked there but they are footnotes to history for the last 17 years, no human has been out of Earth's orbit. Our shuttles are always within the shores of Earth's gravity, much as the ancient seafarers stayed within sight and safety of land. The fact is, the Earth below keeps us from the sky above. 
Yet, like Columbus, Magellan, the Vikings, all great adventurers went into the unknown generations before practical settlers arrived. There's always a pause between discovery and use. In the late 60s, because of the Soviet challenge in space, we took a higher risk and had a great adventure. Today, there's less challenge and less risk. That other America, that other country of 20 years ago, they did things differently there. Dan Rather for CBS News. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.